The ongoing trial against Hurt Wilders for his televised pledge to reduce Moroccan immigration has culminated in Wilders being charged with inciting racial hatred. It's a kind of weird ruling though, as no actual punishment has been instituted, solely the charge alone. The idea being that as a politician, Wilders will face punishment enough. So to clarify, this amounts to a political sanction. In short, this conviction delegitimizes Wilders' message and thus will reduce his ability to compete electorally. However, this won't matter at all though, and here's why. Implementing restrictions or sanctions on political entities can and has worked in the Netherlands, but this only tends to work when certain prerequisites are met first. Number one, the party already has little to no credibility in the eyes of the public, and two, the party isn't a well-organized electoral machine. Seeing as we're already focused on the Netherlands, let's have a look at far-right activity preceding Wilders, the state's treatment of them, and the effect that it had. Let me be clear, I'm not saying Wilders is far-right. The example is to provide contrast as well as equivalency. In 1944, Queen Wilhelmina passed the resolution concerning the dissolution of treasonous organizations. This granted the government license to dissolve any national socialist undertaking in the future. At the time, this was used to ban the NSB, a Nazi party that had lackluster success even in the 1930s, but became sanctioned by the Nazis throughout their occupation. Another party, the NESB, was formed in the 1950s and this was banned too, despite its membership only amounting to a couple of hundred individuals. 1971 saw the founding of the Dutch People's Union or the DVU. Made up largely of old NSB members, the party took a hardline National Socialist stance on immigration. One distributed leaflet read, The Hague must stay white and safe. Help me free our city from the plague of the Surinamese and the Antillianese. In 1977, the party was able to get a whopping 0.4% of the vote. The next year, the party was banned by The Hague, but due to some weird legal loophole, continued its activity. By this time, the party had become overtly neo-Nazi, and by 1981, the party was only able to achieve 0.1% of the popular vote. In 1980, Henry Brookman founded the Centre Party. Brookman was a former member of the National Centre Party, an organisation that lasted only a year, closing after its members attacked Moroccans on hunger strike inside a church an excellent way to do politics. The Centre Party tried to be different from the DVU in that it wanted the educated. Brookman was a professor at a university and he tried to surround himself with such people. Unfortunately, this in some ways disadvantaged him. His employer put immense pressure on him to distance himself from his extreme politics and thus he appointed Hans Janmaat to lead the party instead. They did okay in the EU elections of 1984. They got over 2% of the vote, which compared to the DVU, is a resounding success. Their slogan, get foreigners out of Europe, clearly resonated with some of the electorate, but problems arose between the extremists and the nationalists. By this point, the party had one seat in parliament held by Janmat, but Janmat was kicked out of his own party in 1984 after becoming increasingly critical of the growing neo-Nazi presence of many of the party's members. As a result, the party had no parliamentary representation. Other moderates fled the party, leaving only a hardcore of mostly neo-Nazis remaining. The party, in blunt, was in complete disarray. In 1986, the party was unable to gather enough signatures to compete in elections. So, hilariously, they told members of the public they were signing a petition against rent increases. The party obviously was accosted for this and done for electoral fraud, fined and dissolved due to bankruptcy. The party then became the Centre Party 86 and was unable to contest any elections ever and was outlawed in 1997 for endangering the public order and disseminating materials intended to incite hatred. So what happened to Hans Jan Matz? Well, after being forced from his own party, he founded another, his own, the Centre Democrats. In May 1994, they won 2.5% of the vote in the parliamentary elections and had 77 seats in municipal councils. This is the best a radical right party had ever done in the Netherlands, and it did so on a platform similar to that of the Front National in France or the FPO of Austria. But its success was very short-lived, and the party, for all intents and purposes, collapsed in 1998. The party was under intense, constant and heavy criticism all the time. A former cordon sanitaire was lifted, which resulted in a mass media and political bombardment, placing the social and professional costs of working for the party through the roof. As a result, the quality of the councillors they were able to appoint was disgraceful. To provide some colourful illustrations, Henry Selhorst, appointed to Arnhem, was a drug dealer 
and the signatures he secured in order to run for office were garnered from his drug adult clientele. Another, Richard Van der Play, had been caught in possession of a gun, drugs and neo-Nazi literature. Another counsellor for the CD suffered from dementia. Another was filmed bragging about committing arson against immigrants. The list of embarrassments goes on. This disarray can be seen as a result of the state and public sanctions put against the CD. In an environment of intense political and social pressure, many will be dissuaded from getting involved. Moderates with jobs, social lives, family, social status will not join a party if they could potentially lose everything for doing so. Extremists, on the other hand, will. Extremists don't tend to care about possible social and professional repercussions, and their membership will thusly drive the moderates away. To be succinct, extremists tend to have the least to lose and therefore will embrace the stigmatization process gladly. But this has the dual effect of alienating and dissuading the moderates from joining a party, thus damning the political party to obscurity. The CD dissolved in 2002. So the MVU was banned and destroyed. The Centre Party was fined and destroyed. The Centre Party 86 was banned and destroyed. The Centre Democrats were stigmatized to such an extent that the poor quality membership destroyed itself. So why can't this happen to Wilders? Well, for two principal reasons. One, Wilders already has public and political credibility, and two, his party is well organized and functioning. Prior to Wilders' shift to the radical right, he was a member of the VVD, and at one point dubbed to be its next leader. Wilders is a career politician, he's media savvy, and he has legitimacy, not only from the establishment but also in the eyes of the public. As my video on Wilders stated, Wilders is an odd case, for often we find populist parties decreasing in radicalism, the closer they get to power. But Wilders is different, and precisely so because he didn't need to work towards credibility, he already had it. In the past, parties have threatened Wilders with a cordon sanitaire, but due to his political clout, this is ineffective. Indeed, come 2010, the PVV, Wilders' party, became kingmaker and was necessary for the formation of a coalition government between the VVD and the Christian Democrats. Wilders then dissolved this government two years later over disagreements. This proved Wilders could be an integral part of government. He's a politician like all the others. A cordon sanitaire or banning or intense stigmatization only works if the party or group is small and lacks respectability in the first place. That's basically what the prosecution effort aimed to do, reduce legitimacy. But because no actual punishment was meted out, this became an explicitly political trial of legitimacy and not of legality. This had the reverse effect then of undermining the legitimacy of the court and increasing the legitimacy of Wilders' platform. As a result, public opinion of Wilders has actually increased and not the opposite. The NVU, the National Centre Party, the Centre Party, the Centre Party 86, the Centre Democratic Party all made the mistake of attracting the extremists first. This ensured heavy stigmatisation and legal repercussions and guaranteed that the parties would never have widespread public sympathy. Wilders did the opposite, go for the moderates and then radicalise. By the time the state can clamp down on you, you already have the respectability to push forward and in this case, have more legitimacy than the state itself. Now, there are obviously strong ideological divergences between Wilders and the aforementioned parties, but still, it's interesting to compare the closest comparisons we have in terms of state responses within the Netherlands. Differences in Wilders' ideology do of course play a role to some extent, sure they do, but more so because of the caliber of the people they attract, not necessarily due to the content. Expect a more Europe-wide video on this in the future, but due to current events unfolding, I thought one on the Netherlands and Wilders would be illuminating.